In this video, I'm going to show you how to use the O'Connor syntax for the purposes of conducting a parallel analysis in SPSS, which will allow you to evaluate or determine the number of dimensions to extract from a data set uh, in a more rigorous statistical way than a scree plot. So the syntax looks like this. So I'm uh, going to apply this syntax to the data file. Uh, that includes nine intelligence subtests, just like was uh, described in the textbook. And the syntax looks like this. Uh, and you can read all this information if you want. Basically, I'm going to describe to you how to use the syntax so that uh, in addition to reading, you can follow along. Uh, so the first bit of information you need to focus on is this get file, get raw file star, which says basically use the data file that is open right now. So you want your data file to be open. And then we have var equal, and this is where you place all the variable names that you want to include in the analysis. And in this case here, I, I have matrix reasoning, MR, which is MR, and then I've got FW, and FW is next. So all the names of the variables, and I've got nine here. Once you've got that, uh, you will want to specify the number of resamples that you want the uh, program to create in order to derive the uh, non-systematic data that include eigenvalues that are not statistically significant. So you want to compare your field data, the real data that you collected, against these randomly distributed uh, randomly non-correlated uh, data that uh, have the same characteristics as your own data in terms of sample size and the number of variables. I'm going to include this syntax in the commentary, uh, the commentary section of the video. So just look at the description of the video and I'll have this syntax there. So you can just copy and paste it into, syntax, into a syntax file in SPSS. I've got 1,000, probably better to change it to 2,000, I would say. Uh, I think the one I created in the textbook was probably 1,000 data sets, probably better to create with 2,000. Uh, here I've got the desired percentile, which is 50. I would say most people use the 50th percentile to compare the randomly generated data eigenvalues against the field data eigenvalues. But as I describe in the textbook, there can be circumstances in which using the 95th percentile, which is closer to using P less than 0 0.05 framework, uh, might be appropriate. In this case here, I'm just going to do it with 50th percentile just to show you how things change. Uh, here we have the principal components or factor analysis option one or two. In the first instance, I'm going to do uh, compute one and I'm going to do a component analysis with the 50th percentile. And then we have the option of normally distributed random data, which is what almost everybody does when they apply parallel analysis. But this uh, syntax is fairly sophisticated, and it allows you to do permutations of the raw data, which is the number two, and you'd specify two if you wanted that. That could be an option, of uh, an appropriate option, when the data that you have are very peculiar. They might have really non-normally distributed data, for example, and you might want to use your raw data to compare against uh, your field data uh, because your data are so unusual in that respect. Uh, I, I, I'm just going to select one for this one because there's nothing really unusual with my data, and uh, that's fine. The rest of the uh, syntax is really the executions to derive the results except for the very last line here, which actually creates a scatter plot of the randomly generated eigenvalues and the field data eigenvalues, which is how people usually do a parallel analysis. They look at the graph of the eigenvalues. You don't need the graph. You could just look at the table of results and look at the eigenvalues uh, and compare them against each other. So let's actually run the analysis now. I'm going to run all and it's running the matrix. And the first thing I'm going to point out here uh, is that the raw data had an eigenvalue of 4.17, uh, 
which is that really big eigenvalue that you saw on the screen plot uh, in the previous video earlier in the chapter. And here are the 50th percentiles. Now we've got the means column and the percentile column. And when you select the 50th percentile, as was done here, you're going to get a very similar value to the means of the raw random data eigenvalue. So just focus on the percentile. So you got the raw data and you got your percentiles from the random data. And we can see that 4.17 is larger than 1.33. Therefore, this is a statistically significant eigenvalue from this perspective using the 50th percentile and principal components. Then we've got 1.217, which is actually a little bit smaller than the 50th percentile of 1.22. So on the basis of this result, we would actually not extract this uh, eigenvalue. We'd only extract one dimension from these data because only one of the raw data eigenvalues rank ordered was larger than the 50th percentile random data eigenvalues rank ordered from largest to smallest. So it was a very close call, but this value is technically smaller than this one. Therefore, I would not extract that. And obviously, I wouldn't extract any of these because they're much less than the corresponding random data eigenvalues. If you look at it in a plot, the way it creates it initially, it needs a bit of work. But you can see that this eigenvalue here, the first eigenvalue from uh, 1 to 9, there are going to be 9 eigenvalues because we have 9 variables in the data file you're always going to have the same number of roots equal to the number of variables in the data file. And in this case here, the really large 4.17 eigenvalue is here. And the comparison means and percentile eigenvalues are actually on these lines here. They're basically on top of each other because the means and the 50th percentile are basically the same in these data. Uh, but you can see here, this is the intersection point and you wouldn't even, if you looked only at the graph, you wouldn't be able to tell what was going on. You, would, you wouldn't be able to say precisely what's going on. And that's why you need to look at these table uh, of, of values in order to determine which eigenvalue is bigger than the other. So you don't need this scatter plot. You can rely exclusively on this table. So let's do another one. But this time I'm going to change some of the parameters. Uh, associated with the analysis. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change, uh, I'm only going to change one thing. I'm going to change the uh, estimation method from component analysis to factor analysis. That's actually the only thing I'm going to change here. And I'm going to run it again. And hopefully it works. I hope it didn't actually use the data file. Let's see if it actually made an error. And I didn't make an error. It was smart enough I just mentioned this now that when you run the analysis, it actually creates a new data file and it actually plots for you the eigenvalues that it estimated. And if you're only running your syntax based on whatever file is open, SPSS can mistakenly think that, oh, do you want me to use this data file to run the parallel analysis against? And you do not want that. So just be mindful that that error can happen and delete. Just close this data file if you don't want it or save it and then close it to make sure SPSS is not referencing it. In this case here it was smart enough and it created uh, some new eigenvalues. So this eigenvalue is smaller. 3.65 is smaller than the 4.17 and that's going to happen with a factor analysis. The eigenvalues, I don't know about always, but will probably almost always be smaller than the component eigenvalues. And then the percentiles, which I'm still at the 50th percentile, uh, we have 0.38, much smaller than what the components were, but that's to be expected. 3.65 is bigger than the ra random data uh, largest eigenvalue of 0.38, so I'd extract that dimension. 0.64 is larger than 0.26, so I would extract this one. 0.386 is larger than this one, so I'm up to 3 where the raw data, field data, eigenvalue, rank ordered is bigger than the random data, but then I get to the fourth and that's where things change. 0 0.04 is not larger than 0 0.09. And on the basis of these results, I would extract three dimensions from the data, which is statistically rigorous and also consistent with theoretical 
information, we know that there's not just one general factor of intelligence. There are some specific factors as well. And so this is supporting the idea that we should extract uh, three factors. They're probably going to be correlated with each other. And we have that as a rigorous piece of evidence. Now, if I change the percentile from 50 to 95, all these percentiles are going to increase. And probably, uh, well, who knows? I might not get 0.38 to be larger than 0.16. Let's just try it. Let's see what we get when I change this to the 95th percentile. It's going to be tougher now to get a statistically significant eigenvalue. And it does look like it has caused some errors because now it's having problems with this data file here. Let's see if I can fix it. If not, I might just end the video here anyway. Let's see if I can get it to run now. Yeah, it looks like it ran this time. Yeah, so here we've got uh, 0.517 as the 95th percentile eigenvalue with the raw data, which is bigger than the eigenvalue that I got when I had the 50th percentile. 0.387 is smaller than the 95th percentile random data eigenvalue 0.517. So it's tougher to get a statistically significant eigenvalue in this context. Uh, so we go down from 0.365 bigger than the random data. Yep. 0.64 bigger than 0.355. 0.386 bigger than 0.24 and 0.04 is not. So we would actually come to the same conclusion whether we use the 50th percentile or the 95th uh, with the factor analytic model, not the component model. And I would trust the factor analysis results in this case. So that is how you do a parallel analysis and the one that I did in the textbook.